introduce our speakers. Thanks, Lander. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, the two most important features we're going to utilize this evening are the chat feature, which many of you are already using. You can find that on the bottom center of your screen if you're logging on on a laptop. And I believe if you're on a mobile device, it, it pans up as a bar. Um, if not, um, when you click on it on the panelist section. And the panelist selection is where you can also find the raise your hand feature. So next to your own name, you should see a little hand. And I think mine's yellow right now, but if you click on it, I think it turns blue. And then at the end of the presentation, oops, sorry about that. When we're asking questions, we can give you the option to tune in and ask Marnie and Ken your your question with your own audio. But if that doesn't sound like something you wanna do, just drop your question in the chat box and Lander and I will do our best to pan through and ask you the question, ask Marnie and Ken the questions are for you. So with that, I think I'll hand it back over to Lander and we can do our formal introduction. Awesome, thanks so much, Jake. You're welcome. So we are so excited to have Marnie and Ken Kroll here with us this evening. Um, Ken is a retired ecologist and Marnie is a natural history writer. They are both self-taught biologists, which is super cool. And I learned recently, they donated the first parcel of the Kingdom Woods Conservation Area to Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a much loved preserve to this day. Um, so thank you both so much for that. And thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to you and to Jake for the slides. Hello. Gonna be Ken. Yes. There we go. Ah, we're getting it full screen and gorgeous. Perfect. Okay. I think you can do that. Yes, um, next. Yeah. Uh, Jake, next. There we go. Beautiful. Well, to begin at the beginning, at least the beginning of mosses, some 470 years ago, when the ancestors of today's mosses moved on to land, they absorbed CO2, of course, through the process of photosynthesis, and they secreted organic acids that um, dissolved the minerals in the rock, thus starting the first formation of soil. They also emitted oxygen, which then allowed the evolution of land animals. Uh, next. Welcome to Crockett Cove Preserve Woods in Deer Isle, Maine, which is where we are right now. Ecologists call this a coastal fog forest. Because they lack vessels to transport water, most mosses are found in moist habitats. This is a wonderful place to visit, rain or shine, summer or winter. Come meet the mosses. There are over 300 species of mosses in Maine and we will introduce you to a few. Next. Number four to learn. To learn to recognize mosses by sight, habitat, but also color is useful. The mossy forest floor may look like an all green sheet to you now, but we are about to change that. Next. <laughs> At a 4th of July parade, and here, of course, is the famous Deer Isle Parade, we learn to recognize friends, or we do recognize our friends, about as far away as we can see them. Marnie will tell you how we do that. Yes. Next. Oh, no, no, not next. Yes. Keep that. Next. Yep. Okay, next. Go ahead. What we know about the brain suggests that something like this happens. We collect images, which are then stored subconsciously. A new image is quickly compared and we are signaled about its nature. Is it a potential danger in the past? We can use that to help learn mosses, not because we might encounter any hostile mosses, but because using this innate process, a sort of form of pattern recognition, for our, for our current purposes, this can be a useful strategy. Next. So 
Start by collecting images of the most common moss around us, on the floor, on rocks, on rotten logs, etc. That may be what the Brits call getting one's eye in. This huge mat is probably entirely Schreber's moss or big red feather moss. Hold on a minute. Ken? All right, then we can go on to learn the next most common one. Half a dozen may be a good number for primary goal, just six of them, a number of units easy to recall. This is how we learned them one by one. This tardigrade or so-called water bear sucks fluid from mosses. Like nematodes, many mites and even tinier rotifers, the tardigrades live amid the mosses and count on the humidity to keep them from drying up. Some of the nematodes and tardigrades eat the moss, but many mites live here feeding on fungi and algae, but remarkably few larger animals dine on mosses. Next. This is a close-up of that moss that formed the huge carpet you saw two slides back uh, when Marnie was speaking. This moss was named after Daniel von Schreber, a naturalist, a student of Linnaeus. Commonly, it's called big uh, stem, red stem moss or red feather moss. Um, it's easy to recognize from a fair distance because you'll notice the uh, red uh, midrib there, the red stem, which gives the moss a, a reddish color and it forms much of the large uh, carpets that we see in our uh, coastal forests here. Next. This is stair step moss. And it is a, it's a splendid moss, uh, a second moss to learn after red feather. There are annual whorls of leaves which form on fronds um, budding off from last year's growth. So it gives that stepped appearance, which you can see very clearly in the left hand slide. And we find it uh, mixed in with red feather moss and going up uh, on rocks, as you see on the right there, they form a little cap to the uh, rock. Uh, next. I think that's probably one of your favorites, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and while we have it on there, um, it's a little hard to see with this magnification, but the leaves are divided uh, doubly or triply. Okay. The branches have branches. Yeah. Okay, next, Jake. Uh, next. Yeah, we lost brocade moss. Can you back up? The, net, the backing up is worth it. There we go. This is a particularly common and gorgeous moss with a great name, brocade, because it looks sort of like a fancy satin gown material. And you recognize it by that elegant sheen. And it has a slightly orange golden cast. And it's neatly triangular. Look on the left and see how those are nice, neat looking things. Individual strands of slightly overlapping leaves on slightly reddish stems do look like bright embroidery floss. And note the pinnate, like a pair of wings, that means. You've got to get used to some of this moss terminology. The pinnate branching may stop near the tip. See, they're not branched on either side. The tip just gets the longer, rather scrawny top. And Ken? Um, you notice how the, on the right there, when we start up at the top, of, it's, it's a face of a rock, and you can see brocade in the upper right corner there, but it begins to get stringy. And the problem is that all that hangs in strings isn't really brocade. Uh, it can grade into related species uh, in the same genus of hypnum. But how one identifies which species that is requires a microscope. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, 
And that's where we fade out. We don't use a microscope. We're telling you how to do the way we do, which is standing up and looking. And as far as you can see it, you're pretty likely to be right. Next, especially with this next one. Jake, can you give us the next one? Yes. The common names are reason enough to learn this moss. Big shaggy. This is a widespread boreal moss with tolerance for many types of habitats. But once you learn to spot its characteristic look, disheveled, putting it nicely, yellowish green, upright, red stems, You'll probably notice patches of it where this moss carpets the forest floor so exuberantly that it makes you want to laugh at its other common name. And I didn't make this up, electrified cat's tail. Big shaggy can be really big and really shaggy. Next. Penny cushion moss, these are extremely common. You see them uh, in clusters scattered throughout our forests. Both the English and the Latin name are interesting. Uh, Luco Brian means white moss. Um, and clearly it's usually that pale green color, although after rain, it can get quite green. Pin cushion, well, it certainly looks like your grandmother's pin cushion. Somehow red squirrels love to pick those apart and we don't know why they don't eat them. Are they using it for nesting material? They're looking for something we don't know about. Uh, maybe somebody can elucidate us on that. Um, next. That's it. Oh, that's you. Sorry, well, it's there. Uh, windswept moss, broom moss, uh, dicranium. Um, this gets its name because it looks as though the wind blew in this case, from left to right, uh, as it does over a field of grain. Uh, there are several local species of dicranum, and they're kind of fun to try to identify. But anyway, this one is the windswept or broom moss, and the most common of the genus. So if you just say dicranum, you're going to be all right. Next. Except this slide on the left. It's all one slide. They're growing, dicranum is growing right up next to dicranella. And you can guess from the words that dicranum is the big version and the small version, dicranella. Dicranella has a velvety, silky look and it tolerates being stepped on. So look on the right, you'll find it on many of our trails. And as I say, it doesn't mind if you step on it. Next. That's a good one, Ken. Oh. Loveless name, delicate fern moss. Um, this one in the right habitat is, is quite abundant and extremely pretty moss. Um, but look again, it's not exactly brocade. It's that delicate fern moss. And these uh, triangular leaves are definitely cut in three times. Um, cut once, cut twice, and way out on the little tips, cut again, uh, triply cut. The side branches have side branches. So next. This, this is polytricum, you'll, you'll hear that word quite a bit. It's common hair cap. And if you look on the left, the starry, narrow, dark green leaves vertically hug up against the stem. They just cuddle up, see the brown, when the weather has been dry. This is perhaps our most common hair cap, but it's not the only one we have here. Look on the right. Notice that, it, that those ends of the leaves don't have any rusty leaf tips and they don't have white arms, white needles out at the end. So you have to look twice at this one, but you'll find it quite often on the dry sides of roads or paths. It's quite common, so hair cap you'll like. Next, and I'll show you why. Next slide, yes, because 
It's called hair cap because it's like a little cap. And, I, and what I did here was I grabbed it by the nose, the peak of the cap and pulled it off. So you can see, I pulled it off several different ones so I could set up this picture. The, these spore capsules are covered with a dense layer of silvery hairs. And it's so much fun to do this with kids, for example, to carefully pluck off the shaggy fringe veil of hairs covering the capsule. Going back to your high school biology, in bryophytes, in mosses, this sporophyte, which you're uh, seeing here, um, from which the, on which the capsule grows, is, grows out of the uh, predominant gametophyte. In other words, the green mossy part we've been seeing and is familiar. Uh, the gametophyte is haploid, that is, it has only a single set of chromosomes, and this sporophyte is on diploid. Doesn't that sound like high school biology lab? Next. An artist go crazy. Look at all the moss sporangia pictured here. Muskinae from Ernst Haeckel's Kunstformen der Natur is a 1904 painting. There are several kinds of moss you can learn to identify by their spore caps, at least genus, if not species, here on Deer Isle. So always take a close look for spore caps, since they can often determine just exactly which species you have found. Next. When higher plants, that is ferns and flowering plants, um, colonized the land, they had true roots and they had vascular systems, which allowed them to move fluids and minerals upwards. Um, since tree bases funnel uh, these uh, debris from the bark down again, in other words, what goes uh, around, what goes down comes around again, um, the nutrients are collected at the bottom by various mosses. We call them tree base mosses. And here you see the very bottom of a tree base and root. There can actually be a vertical zonation there of different species of moss going up the base of the tree trunk. Uh, but again, these are very difficult to identify. Um, so we settle for just calling them tree base. <laughs> It's not exactly a cop out, but uh, no. we'll have to do. Okay. Next, Jake. Oh. We'll take a look at sphagnum mosses. Sphagnums are actually in a separate uh, taxonomic group within the mosses. There are some uh, 40 species which are uh, found in Maine, perhaps, of which uh, a dozen or more uh, were likely to find uh, commonly. Sphagnum mosses are, of course, familiar as baled peat moss, uh, which is used as a mulch. Uh, peat is used for several other purposes. Uh, the Irish, of course, of course, burn consolidated dead peat. Uh, it's used for smoking uh, scotch. <laughs> um, the uh, living or recently growing plants have had a number of interesting uses. Uh, used for chinking log buildings, which I've actually done. You can tell these are his favorite mosses um, too. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, sphagnums are used in a number of cosmetic and medicinal um, manners. Uh, they actually are uh, somewhat antibacterial, at least some of the species. Uh, they can be used for stuffing uh, boots in the Arctic for warmth. Um, well, here you see in front of you, in the uh, lower part of the slide, a greenish moss. That is our old friend, Schreber's red feather. And then as you move up into the right, you see a lighter color. Uh, that is a sphagnum, Jurgensonii. Uh, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. And it is growing where the soil is just a little wetter, not so well grained. And we move from forest into bog. Down 
uh, down slope, which is in the upper right, you see a bog where there are several species of sphagnum. And we do not encourage you to do a bog slog. And those are the, the sphagnum species out in the bog are much more numerous than what you see than just around the edges. And I, we got our numbers of sphagnum mosses from Ralph Pope, who wrote one of the wonderful field guides. So we feel fairly confident in telling you that if you want to do the easy ones, do the ones we're presenting here. If you've got a microscope and you want to argue over exactly how the cells are arranged and that sort of thing, you can uh, make the correct identification most of the time. And unfortunately, or fortunately, humility you need, because you, you're going to be wrong a lot, a microscope. And as you sort of gathered, you have to be willing to learn a special vocabulary to become an expert in identifying sphagnums. But here are the two that we will introduce you to the wonderful world of sphagnum. Next. There you go. This is Jurgensonii, that light colored moss we just saw on the last slide. Um, on the right, you can see that it's got a kind of open growth, uh, graceful, uh, stellate or starry uh, fronds which surround the uh, capitulum or cap, that center area, which is characteristic of sphagnums. Uh, it has a light, very light color, and the stalk snaps like celery, and that's actually a a way that you can identify it. It's one of our more common uh, mosses, I was gonna say upland, uh, found in woodlands as opposed to bogs. And uh, you can really identify it without even bending over from its general appearance. But if you're not sure or wanna have some fun, you can snap it like celery. Uh, uh, sphagnums have a kind of translucent, stocky appearance. And that's because they alternate cells, living cells for photosynthesis, and then dead cells which hold water. And of course, one of their characteristics is to not only live in wet places, but actually to create um, hummocks or little um, mounds where they draw up and hold the uh, water. On the left, um, you see the black spore capsules, uh, which is another thing it's fun to hunt for. And Marnie found some here and got a very good photo. So those again are the sporophytes growing out of the uh, green gametophyte, up right out of the um, uh, top, the capitulum head. Okay. So when you find those little round black spots, if you're lucky, that would clinch the identification as the Gorgons, Gorgonsonii. Now, if you give us the next slide, which is the other one that's common, first off, look at the slide on the left. Those see those are brown capsule tops. See how they're and and they're more teardrop shaped. So terrific! We know now that that's going to help us with our identification, which is called I could call it dense packed sphagnum. Look on the right. See how squashed together they are. This is yellowish green, maybe brownish, maybe quite bleached looking because individual parts of the plants have been growing in the shade. Uh, sometimes there are actual spots of bleach where a fox or somebody has peed on them. Um, so notice, but notice that you won't always see the capsules. The different mosses have slightly different seasons of when they make the capsules, but you'll get used to seeing this compact dense uh, along the sides of trails. In other words, not in the bog, remember, but this look is not like the looser, starry look of the Gurdon Sonai. Next. Well, Marnie emphasized before that you need a microscope for identifying sphagnums. You certainly can't always rely on the obvious characteristic of color. Uh, sometimes you'll see bleached area where a fox is peed. And <laughs> Seriously, uh, they love to do that. They do it on pin cushions too, uh, the male fox. Um, but uh, sunlight is another agent. And the red seems to occur 
where light is brighter, uh, occurring in the open, occurring when leaves drop in the fall. Um, it isn't at all clear biochemically why this happens, but either uh, green chlorophyll is not present or it's been being masked by the red. Um, I? So I, I, some of these um, sphagnums you perhaps can identify by color, but again, you have to be careful because it could be just a seasonal characteristic rather than a characteristic of the species. See, Marnie who paints is really keen on color, but sometimes color can just lead to con confusion. But the whole thing with these mosses is you do your subconscious after you see a few of them and you say, ah, yes, that's exactly like what it's, what. We, what we learned, it'll, it'll help you a lot. But there's another color coming up. If I can have the next slide, please. See, I see liverworts and they're bryophytes, but they're not moss. I see liverworts as a slightly more emerald color. They're often slightly bluish, translucent color. And this one is our most common one, Bazania. While most mosses have leaves which spiral around the stems, liverworts usually have pairs of small leaves opposite one another. And here's the key. They look as if they've been run through a pasta machine. They're flat. The leaf shapes and the edges of various species can be quite distinctive. We call this one three-toothed bazania or three-lobed bazania. If you take a, you can even see in the center of this picture the little teeth on the edge. And there's three. And the liverworts lack a costa, a midrib. The three-toothed bazania here is now more often called by its English common name, common whipwort. There's not general agreement on common names for either mosses or liverworts, perhaps because they're not commonly noticed. Next. Another little wart, or perhaps two, there are two species of this uh, genus Tolidium, which are extremely difficult to uh, tell apart. So we will settle for calling them Tolidium. Uh, notice it has a reddish orange color, uh, looks a bit like a hooked rug. Uh, again, this is one you can learn to identify just as you're walking along the trail. Uh, may take a while, but all of a sudden you form that uh, image gestalt and there it is on uh, rotten uh, logs as you walk along and uh, quite obvious and quite common. Um, it's fuzzy looking. However, so. you're not gonna say if you're smart, anything more than it's tolidium because the genus is easy, beyond that is hard. Next slide. I want to interrupt there. I'm going back to sphagnums. Uh, I, <laughs> obviously I find sphagnums interesting, whereas Marnie thinks we should just call them sphagnums because they are so difficult. And as of yet, we don't have a microscope. But okay, all of yet, listen to him. You're gonna get a microscope? No, I can see them. They're she, pretty. They're she, pretty. Loves, she loves these uh, liver warts, so on to another one. <laughs> yes. Uh, this one is its scientific name is Frulania Asa Gray Anna. Asa Gray Anna. That's Asa Gray is a, was a Harvard biologist contemporary with Darwin. So if you thought the name slightly rang a bell, that might be why. So these reddish brown strings of opposite leaves turn darker, almost black in the winter. And they can be seen tracing their lines high up on tree trunks, just about the height of your head. You don't even have to bend over. And this one, all you have to do is look straight ahead. And they're quite common here on the tree trunks. And they're, it's a little bit unusual for a liverwort or any moss to be up there on the tree trunk, but they manage quite well. And you'll be surprised as you now drive by our country lanes and walk through the preserves, you see these, which you never noticed before. So I told you that this will make you look at the forest in ways you've never seen before. Next. Well, liverworts love wet places. You often find them 
on rocks and streams and uh, in the tropics, on the other hand, where in the rainforest, they'll uh, grow right on the ground and they're huge, huge, meaning several inches. Uh, but uh, let's say next is a few words about lichen. Uh, lichens are not mosses. Uh, lichen is of course a symbiotic combination of an alga, one or more species we're finding out of alga, uh, possibly with a cyanobacteria living uh, in the structure, uh, the filaments of one or more species of fungus. So it, it, it's beginning to appear that some of these combinations, of course, are quite fixed. Otherwise, we couldn't name lichen species. But on the other hand, it seems to be somewhat of a fluid association here with the fungus gathering um, minerals, nutrition from the substrate, and the and providing the structure and the alga, of course, uh, conducting photosynthesis to actually convert uh, CO2 from the atmosphere into um, organic matter, carbohydrates. Uh, this uh, lichen is called Oberia pulmonaria. Now notice the root there for pulmonary, the common name is lung lichen. And you'll find it growing quite often on red maples, but uh, generally on hardwoods, uh, living, dying, dead, um, and uh, locally. On the side of our trails. Next. So why are we showing you lichens if this is a talk about mosses? Next because people think they are mosses. This is not a moss. But it's called reindeer moss. And it's, see the, how grayish the color is? Many of our lichens have this grayish color. There's Marion color again. Uh, and as a fat, matter of fact, reindeer do eat it. So that's Definitely. reindeer moss. We have it in patches before it gets invaded by things like wild blueberry. So that's our reindeer moss, not a, not a moss, it's a lichen. Next slide. Another one, see there's that pale grayish color, a little warmer color this time hanging on the trees. This one is called Spanish moss. Oh no, it's not. The real Spanish moss in the South is actually a relative of pineapple. And this grayish one, guess what? It's a lichen. And this one is a lot of fun because we call it old man's beard. Now there's different species of these, but one of the things that's fun is that you can tweak it and it's slightly elastic. It's a little bit stretchy. So you get to tweak the lichen that's called old man's beard, not a moss. Next. There we go. But all lichens are not gray. This one is a golden yellow. It can vary from um, a red orange to a paler yellow, as you see here, yellow orange. Um, this is Xanthoria and, or, or sunburst lichen. And you may recognize that it's generally found on rocks along the shore here. Um, just above the spray zone. Um, and if you look, I don't think we can see it here in the uh, magnification, but uh, if you look in the bottom one at about 12 o'clock or 4 o'clock, you actually can see the fruiting structures, little discs or apothecia. Bigger lumps. <laughs> okay. So now we're getting technical. We want to look closer, he's telling us. Next slide, Jake. Please. About that closer look. When we're not having the office closed for COVID reasons, Island Heritage Trust has about a dozen of these hand lenses that you can borrow. You can sign them out. But you need to learn how to use them. And mostly, you've seen people do it wrong. You bring the lens up close to your eye 
And then you bring the moss up close to that, not hold the hand out and then think you can see there's just not enough. When you see the image come into focus, lean your middle moss holding finger against your hand that holds the lens to steady the arrangement. Then you look very professional. Now this guy who's looking very professional doing the looking is named Dr. David Wagner. And he's an Oregon bryologist. The West Coast, of course, has the Pacific Ocean doing the same thing as the fog forest does for here. And Dr. Wagner has been extremely helpful to us over a number of years. It's very interesting how, in the first place, moss spores go all around the globe. That's not surprising. They're just like little dust particles. But now that we have the internet, moss fanciers talk to each other on the internet and they help each other. Next slide. I think we need to skip one. Two, Why? One. I think we need to do one more. There, there we, we go. go. Um, Yes, I have a guide, which is a guide to British mosses and lichens, which happens to have very good pictures. And of course, many of them are ours, but there are local uh, field guides. Marnie has all mentioned, already mentioned Ralph Pope. Uh, on the right there, you see his book, Mosses, Liverworts, and Hornworts, uh, all bryophytes of the Northeast. And he does live in Eastern Maine. In the upper left, uh, common mosses of Northeast and Appalachians. This one is just mosses, not even the liverworts. And it is by uh, Carl McKnight, who was a colleague of mine, He's and, actually a friend of ours, actually. and several others. Uh, down in the left, uh, mosses of the Northern Forest. Um, that is. Well, it's published by Comstock, which is affiliated with the with Cornell, as is Pope's book. Uh, you see there the little pocket guide. There's also a uh, <clears throat> coffee table size guide with a lot of uh, good descriptions of the northern mosses. <clears throat> there are three or four Facebook Facebook groups uh, generally some combination of mosses, lichens, ferns, and fungi. And if you just uh, do a search on Facebook, they'll come up. Um, in addition, Wikipedia has wonderful articles which you can um, glean. And finally, there is iNaturalist, which many of you may use. It's a combination of a source for identification and also a source for logging observations. Uh, it's done internationally and it's a repository of data uh, which can be quite useful for people doing long-term studies or geographic, biogeographic studies. Um, and Marnie, you were gonna say a little more about Pope. Yes, I, I wanna say thank you, especially to Ralph Pope because he came to Deer Isle and gave a boss talk and walk at Crockett Cove and put in white plastic labels, stuck them in right in the ground, right next to the moss. And the number on them is the page in his book. And they're still there. So if you were to buy his book and go for a walk in Crockett Cove, you could indeed turn to the right page and there you would be. And we got to corresponding with him. It turns out, of course, he's friends of friends of ours who are also biologists. And he concurred that our group, our way of saying, okay, we'll teach you six easy ones and even allowable to put in the, the uh, liverwort was a good way to learn. Start something so that you have enough confidence to say you can get through this. And this idea that you teach yourself, uh, uh, one of the people that we really enjoy is, um, check out 10,000 things. That's a blog from a self-described recreational naturalist. I love this phrase, recreational naturalist from the Pacific Northwest. So he, this is from a fellow who um, taught himself the way we taught ourselves. And he does a beautiful job. You won't know all of his mosses, but the, it, gets, it gives you insight into 
the patterns of learning that people use. And he actually does use a microscope and his microscope takes great pictures. So that's fun. And then there's a video from a retired Bowdoin ecology professor, Matt Wheelwright, and that's uh, a series that he's made with Maine Audubon. And you can, that will also uh, be something that you'll find that Lander will put up afterwards. Now, Nat is, he's actually recently co-authored a book with Bernd Heinrich on how to be a naturalist, um, but there on the uh, main Audubon site are, as Marty said, a number of his YouTubes on different natural history subjects. And um, now Marty mentioned the importance of teaching yourself or the fun of yeah. learning, which is um, why we really do it. Um, we do have degrees in biology, but we didn't learn any of this uh, in our formal education. We've taught ourselves just wandering out our back door and saying, hey, what's that? Um, and we are helped, of course, by these field guides, which are for sale in, by your local land trust. Um, yep. <laughs> also, um, there is, um, on at least the IHT website, a video which, a YouTube, which Marnie and I did with Jake at Crockett Cove Woods, uh, which you saw in one of the first slides. And that is an absolutely beautiful place, one of many, many uh, where you can go to see mosses. So if you wanted to see us walk you through, there you go. But you see, we couldn't do that today because right at the moment, there's a couple inches of snow over most of the mosses. So we give you this presentation. And this is a Google slideshow. And this is a, some, a reference that again, Lander's gonna post for you. I want you to recognize that you could present this Google slideshow. She's gonna give you the link. And you know, I would be nice if you credit it to us, but it will have speakers footnotes, which are about what we've, said this time, a little different style. And you can also take good photographs with your smartphone. These pictures, all of them, we took with our old fashioned iPhone sevens. So you probably have much more modern version of a smartphone and the smartphones take absolutely gorgeous pictures. And when you put them, bring the pictures home and put them on a laptop screen or a desktop computer, you can see them so much better. It's a magnification process that's absolutely wonderful and helpful. And you can just sit there and say, oh my, aren't these mosses beautiful? And to think all the years that I've walked right by it and didn't even know it. Uh, full disclosure, a few of the better pictures were taken with Marnie's Olympus, but uh, we also have some high tech uh, equipment uh, to en uh, enhance our iPhone photos. That is a $35 clip-on close-up lens. Oh yeah. We, <laughs> which, which does wonders. You can buy at Walmart. <laughs> buy a cheap $30, $30 clip-on magnifying lens for a smartphone. So on that technical note, we will go now to any questions. Are there questions, Lander? <laughs> Yes, there uh -oh. are questions. <laughs> uh -oh. We have questions <laughs> streaming in. Thank you both so much. That was excellent. Um, Jake you. and I will bounce back and forth. And we have some questions in the Q&A box as well as the chat box. And I will keep an eye out for any hands that might be raised. So feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask Marnie and Ken a question directly. Um, Jake, do you want to start? I, I would be happy to, Lander, and, and Marnie and Ken, thank you so much for always being so generous with sharing your knowledge. It's, it's wonderful to have you here this afternoon. I um, might even have contributions uh, from knowledgeable listeners. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. And I, I have a quick question for you, Lander, because we spoke very highly of Crockett Cove. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, which Blue Hill Heritage Trust do you think maybe has the best uh -huh. God. Tough one. I bet you it's a tough one to answer. That is a tough one. You know, I think Patton Stream um, in Surrey has some wonderful, I know it's filled with lichens. Um, mm -hmm. I've taken tons of photos of lichens there. And I believe mosses and some liverworts as well. So that's one that I would suggest. Right. Um, and I think George is on the call and he's also part of Blue Her Heritage Trust. So if he has any ideas, he could put that in the chat box for us as well. All right. 
George, let us know if there's anywhere else we should go check out some mosses. So there is a. Um, you can't miss. <laughs> yes, you, you can't go wrong. Um, let's see. Well, first, Lander, does anybody have their hand raised? Because I'd love, I always love to use that feature if we can. And there's a, there's a lot of questions, so it, we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but hopefully we can provide some contact info. And if there's anything that goes unanswered, people can reach back out to us at the end of this and um, we'll get your questions answer, answered at some point. Yeah, we, we do have a hand. Um, looks like Devra would like to ask a question. So I'm gonna allow you to talk and you just have to unmute mute yourself. Yes, Debra is going to ask it. Debra, it's it sounds like I, I think maybe I can hear you talking faintly, but I, I don't know if if you're using a mic. I don't know if the connection is quite hooked up just quite right, but I can it, it sounds like I can hear you faintly, but I can't hear you well enough. Oh, yeah, that's that's a little better. By the way, anybody who's frustrated because we can't get to their question or we can't answer their question or we can't hear your question, go to Facebook and join, put, type in moss and search and join those moss groups because there's those people are happy to, or, or main naturalists, they're happy to answer your questions. It's a lot of enthusiasm. Have we got Debra yet? I, I think, Linder, is there anybody else with their hand raised? Devra, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we, we can't hear you. It sounds like you're trying to ask your question, but unfortunately, we just can't make it out. Um, so, Jake, I do see a question from Devra in the chat box. So I thought I could ask that. Maybe that's the question she wanted to ask. And then we also have a hand raised um, from Andrew. So I could go to that next, if that sounds good. Sure. Um, Devra's question in the chat box is, how can we encourage the growth of moss? Oh. A spray bottle. <laughs> uh, they're being really to cultivate it. They're, they're, I, I think Google it. Uh, there certainly are ways of doing that. Take brush the leaves off. If everything but dicranella, don't walk on it too much and keep it damp. Yes. And pick pick the right site. Yes. Um, yes. Encourage what you've got is better than transplanting. And if you live in Maine, you probably could have some if you didn't cover it all over with lawn grass. They tend to like acid soil. In fact, the way to get rid of moss is to spray it with uh, lime or something. And they also don't like too much in the way of spruce needles falling on them. <laughs> they need light, obviously. Yes. Awesome. Deborah okay. was also wondering. Oh. Sorry, Deborah's also wondering why is Crockett Cove so moss friendly? Ah, uh, why is Maine coast and why is the Pacific coast so friendly? Because we've got oceans right next, making climate nice and foggy for these little plants that don't have veins to transport water up and down them, so they can, meanwhile, just lie back and enjoy the fog. <laughs> That's the same reason we have white spruces and so forth. Uh, we have the Labrador current coming down here and making fog and Crockett Cove is on uh, the southwest exposure yeah. so it gets uh, more than its share of uh, fog and moisture. Yep, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on to Andrew and Deborah. if we missed any of your questions feel free to put them back in the chat box. Um, so Andrew, I'm gonna allow you to talk. You just have to unmute yourself. Okay, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll start with, are there any invasive or non-native mosses in our area? Good, interesting question. Not that I've ever heard of. In fact, what would be an invasive moss? Since, well, they, since they blow all over the planet naturally, I'm not sure that, that the uh, definition of, oh. okay, our <laughs> ecologist goes, oh, so it might be. Don't know, haven't heard. <laughs> You'll have to ask a moss group that way. Well, let's take the flip side or a related question then. Are any of these endangered or rare? And is it okay to, to you know, scoop some up and put it in our terrariums or in our gardens? Is it okay? We spend most of our time outdoors with the mosses. So <laughs> we wouldn't be around to keep watering them, to keep them alive at our 
in our if we scooped them up and brought them in. But but technically, I understand what you're saying. Be be really careful. And you, obviously, well, you're not mm -hmm. welcome to dig them up at the preserves. So if you have some of your right. property that you'd like to move them closer and put them indoors, mm -hmm. um, try to make sure that you don't give them, you don't cook them, you don't let them dry out. Well, a terrarium is quite different from uh, using using large quantities for landscaping. Though, though incidentally, um, some of these mosses that form the carpet, uh, particularly in, I've read in the Alleghenies in Pennsylvania, brocade moss, which Marnie described, um, are used uh, for various purposes, uh, particularly, of course, along with sphagnum for packing plants in. So there is some commercial use for live mosses, and I wonder how fast they regenerate. Hmm. Yeah, don't wreck them, just go love them. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Jake, do you wanna take the next question? I would be happy to. Um, and I just wanna say there's a couple of questions about the publications that Marnie and Ken mentioned. So Marnie and Ken, if, if you haven't already, would you mind providing Lander a list of the books that you were recommending and then she can provide links uh, so that we can share that knowledge with everyone? Okay. That would and incidentally, uh, since uh, George Field is on here, uh, George wrote a very nice little pamphlet on lichens, uh, but on lichens, uh, for shore acres preserved um, here in Deer Isle, but obviously it applies for the whole area. And shore acres is on the other side of Deer Isle. So <laughs> the weather conditions, Deborah, are a little bit different. And so the mosses that you encounter are a little bit different. You do all right to catch the same six of them, but they're in different numbers. A lot of cat, cat electrified cattail over there. <laughs> I think that one might be my favorite, um, just mostly because just because of the yeah, name. That's uh, a good point. Deer Isle is very interesting and true of many places here. Um, here where we are sitting, uh, we have spruce fir forest. When you move over to the uh, northern or eastern side of the island, there's much more oak, uh, just much more, much different microclimates. And I think Marnie mentioned at the beginning, or will emphasize, that you have to think uh, microhabitat for mosses, um, rocks. What kind uh, of rocks? Tree trunk, yes. What kind of rock? Is it uh, granitic acid or is it, uh, in other places, calcareous? Uh, this makes quite a difference. Just how wet, uh, so forth. Uh, how sunny, shady. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? Uh, well, yes, there are a couple more questions, but Marnie, can I, I, before I forget, I want to let you know that there's a lot of praise and a lot of thanks for your time in the chat box, just in case you don't get a chance to see it. I want you to know what's there. Um, and then we had a nice question from, I think, Lensa, Lensa, if I'm saying your name wrong, I'm sorry, but how many different types of mosses are there? In all, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 300. And well, 300 and some for the state. Um, let's see. We'll say lots. <laughs> lots. I think we had. Because, well, you see how big the books are, and that's just a little selection. So. Uh, oh, heaven. No. Well, there'd be uh, thousands. Well, they're over 300 in Maine. I'm not big on numbers. So that's that's right. just in Maine. That's incredible. Ask yeah. Google, and you'd be surprised that how well that works, and they'll take you to Wikipedia, which has answers well, like that. We will have to look that up. <laughs> that's okay. I think you guys gave a pretty yes. sufficient answer. Job well done. I, I have another uh, comment from Lensa, and she was saying that she really enjoys using the Seek app by iNaturalist, and, and she was wondering if you guys are familiar oh. with that one. And I think uh, Martha Bell showed me that app once on one of our trail walks, and I was amazed by how quickly it was able to, you know, if you have proper service, how quickly it was able to identify what you're looking at. What a, it's a great tool. That's um, something about Jake, because it's the junior version of iNaturalist, and it's also from the California Academy of Science. 
And the reason that we're so big on the California Academy of Sciences is because when you make a post, the experts will help uh, identify it. And then it's kept forever. The data is there for future scientists who are doing big deal, area-wide pieces of research, which help make the answer of whether something's being polluted or not. Is it becoming endangered? Well, we have the data now we can tell instead of just who paid for what, this, what they want to say. And the uh, website that there, uh, the, the uh, sites on Facebook that I mentioned, the groups have kind of a dual role. Uh, a lot of people uh, are just uh, celebrating <laughs> these wonderful plants with uh, beautiful photographs. They obviously have much better than we do, but they're also a place where the beginner can go for identification. And some of the uh, Facebook groups have a little different flavor from uh, some of the others. So that's kind of fun to explore. That's awesome, thanks. We have a question from Karen Hill and she's wondering what is Marnie and Ken's favorite preserve for mosses? Or maybe you have a couple. Yeah, see they're different. Um, but I suppose we'd have to confess it was Crockett Cove because that's where most of our pictures are, especially that gorgeous one right at the beginning. And we live right next door to Bard Island, and Ken is the steward for Bard Island, so we can go there and look up. In other words, every preserve has some good ones, some some that the other people, other places don't have. Yeah. So you know, so, so don't get discouraged. For example, if you can't find Thuidium delicatum. You go to LTW and then you'll find it and say, what's the matter with these people that they didn't put that right at the top of the list? <laughs> well, it's because you don't find it too much at Bard. That Bard is the real place to just look at the overlook and it's all Schreber's small. So you can stand there and look out and say, oh, look at all that red feather. He goes, how can you tell from here? <laughs> because you know the habitat and you know the color. <laughs> Marnie and, Marnie and Ken, I, I have a question for you both, and it's kind of an extension of what Andrew asked earlier when he was raising his hand. Uh, so there's kind of like no, no native moss, if you will, because it's all from all over the place, and it, it just kind of depends on where it settles. And you guys have, you know, lived where you lived for a while, and you've, you know, shown great care to Bard Island, sp specifically in your own backyard. Have you, have you seen the um, different types of mosses change over the years, or has any have any of them kind of taken over in certain areas? The best I can answer to that, let me say that we didn't know them 10, 10 years ago. We would have gone like slide number three. It's all green. <laughs> However, <laughs> that, now that we know, there are some areas that we know they were lumbered in 1950s. And now it's this dense, dense carpet of, of Schreber's red feather moth. You step on it and you might feel like you're going to be in a bog, but you will feel that you're sinking or you try to stick your fingers down through it and you can't make it all the way to granite. So that's the change we've seen is that in, you can do an interesting history if you know when was it cleared. And of course, so much of Deer Isle has been cleared ever since people came here to try to rest the living and farming. Yeah. So, so if it's really, really dense cushion, oh man, you can be impressed. That's a long time. But as far as them changing species or disappearing, that's not anything that we can comment on. So go out there and make your data, folks. Send it to iNaturalist. And then eventually your kids will be able to answer that question. Thank you. It's really been cool because we've had um, several kids on this webinar. Oftentimes we, we mostly have adults and we have kids joining. Um, and there, there's actually a question. What's the best book for young naturalists between the ages of like 10 and 12? Oh boy. <laughs> you can also send me ideas in an email if you have. I'll let, I'll let Marty oh, you're say something. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, I learned my first mosses and lichens at camp. And for a long while, uh, I thought that was all I needed to know. Well, I found out there's a lot more to it and it's a lot of fun. But uh, kids, by all means, this is the time to start and you just learn them one by one by looking and saying, oh, that looks different. It's a little more tuftier. It's a little different color green. I think it's a different kind. And then you look it up, which is the hard part. But there you can go to these sites and get people to help you. 
or uh, I'm not so smart. And your your yes, a seat and your eyesight's probably better than your parents' eyesight. And you can go ahead and make <laughs> up a funny name. It won't be dumber than the electrified cattail. So and people mostly they didn't spend a lot of time looking at mosses before. So I don't know that there is a child, a young reader's book of mosses, but I don't think you need it. You can look and you can study and ask your parents to help get get do get the the, uh, the book that's appropriate to where you are. And you're certainly better online than your parents are probably. So join the moss group. They don't ask how old you are. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I know we're, we're coming up on 5, 5 p.m. or we, I guess we're a little bit past it. Um, I see another, a, a couple of other questions in the chat box. Would, would you guys like to tackle them or would you like to call it a night? Or go for it. Okay. No, if you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, let's do a couple more and then we'll, we'll bid everyone a good night. Um, Let's see. Oh, where'd it go? We have a lot of praise coming in the chat box, as well as Jake said, <laughs> scrolling through Mosses that. Mosses are cool. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question from Cleo, um, and they're wondering, or they, they, they said they saw moss lichen on Green Island, and they were told it was only found there. And they're wondering if you know anything about this. Um, I think I'd turn it around the other way. Um, what? We've uh, I want, I'd, like, I'd like to Green there. Green Islands easy to get to, so I'm intrigued by going there. But actually, islands generally have fewer species, and um, Green Island, while well, certainly is off there at Stonington where it would get fog, it ought to be good for moss. Um, but um, um, I find it likely it isn't found anywhere. I think it's because nobody's uh, looked. Yes, it, it, I would be surprised if that moss weren't found on Deer Isle unless it's, well, who knows, something really special, uh, like a buried treasure. Uh, so I'm, in, I'm intrigued. Send us an email, tell um, us what it is. Yeah, yes, yeah, I'd love to know that. Uh, um, if it's all right with you, Marnie and Ken, I'll put your email address in our follow-up email. So if people have questions sure. for you, um, they can reach out directly. Um, Karen Zimmerman is wondering, is it easy to find the section of trail labeled by Ralph Pope at Crockett Cove? Yes, right as, practically as soon as you pass the entrance sign, look around and there they are. And I'd say there's several dozen of these labels. And I also think it would be worth following up, take the Crockett Cove video that Jake made and those are all in line. And you can take it on your cell phone as you walk along. and. We're telling you, then look, we're looking at this up here, then you'll recognize the spot. Say, like, oh, yes. Is it fair to say some of them are very small uh, clumps of uh, yes, samples? Yes, but you can go to and, the page in the book and, and you'll see whether you can see it. Some of them are uh, um, difficult species, but, uh, but yes, by all means, go. Uh, you can at least, well, for example, on the dicranum, uh, see the uh, genus, even though you uh, may have a little trouble knowing one of the species from another. I'm thinking of two of them there. Uh, but but yes, the, the little little labels are still there and you can read their numbers. Uh, they give the page number and cope uh, just as you could two years ago. Yeah. Go for it. Well, thank you both so much. Um, Lander, I, I did a, a second scan thread. Did we get to all the questions? I think I think we we got Karen's question. Um, I think so. I'm kind of scanning through now. And then I hope we did. A lot, a lot more, a lot more, a lot of praise. A lot, a lot of praise. So okay. thank you both so much. Well, I think I mean we're we're at five after, so we can always you know provide follow up contact info, and we're going to share the resources that Marnie and Ken suggested for um, becoming a becoming a recreational. Um, naturalist. Did I get that right, Marnie? Yes. Okay. No, no, right. So everybody can no, become a recreational naturalist. And you get to be one. The challenge right now is we've got snow on the ground, so you can't <laughs> be the ground with it. But you have no excuse if you can't find Frulania Asa Gray. Uh -huh. 
the red, brown, purple, dark one up on the tree at your own eyesight level. Go find it. Be careful in your car because you will see it from the car. It's on the roadsides. <laughs> and then you're a recreational. I promise I'll look out for it. I know Lander will. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you both so much. This has been wonderful. Yeah. A really great way to spend an evening. Very good. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It was great to have so many people tune in and um, learn from Marnie and Kent. Yes, absolutely. We'll send out the recording and be in touch with you all soon. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thanks to Land Trust for keeping it open to us. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. Bye. -bye. Bye.